Hey, y'all. You know we're a nonprofit, right? That means we rely on donations from listeners to keep this podcast going. So if you have a couple of dollars to spare because every dollar counts, please consider giving at patreon.com slash femfreak. Also, fun fact, in addition to the perks that you'll get as a Patreon subscriber, your donations and contributions on Patreon are also tax deductible because we're a 501c3. So if you want to learn more, if you want to give, please head over to patreon.com slash femfreak. Unfortunately, she operates in an era in which she kind of has to pick one. But at least she's picking like she is determining her course. And I find that part of it really interesting. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and we are at the halfway point on our time traveling journey through the 20th century in Hollywood. To set the scene for our conversation about the mainstream movie industry in the 1950s, we watched the films All About Eve and Sweet Smell of Success. Reed Daniels. What the hell is going on here? Are you going to take Johnny away from me? Take a nap, because you're going to need all your energy tonight. Silly boy. Joining me are my co-host, Kat Spada, and our lovely guest, Alonzo Duralde whom I got to meet a couple of years ago when we were both guests on the podcast, Let's Go Atsuko. I am so excited for this reunion. Now, that was that was a game show podcast. Did either of you win? or It was a game show podcast. I don't remember. <laughs> I, remember how that I forget. It was just so exciting to do a podcast in the same room as other people. <laughs> I know. I'm nostalgic for that kind of action. I know. We all went downtown in a little <laughs> room and like talked to people face to face. It was weird. Didn't think about droplets at anything. (laughs) (laughs) Alonzo, I'm super excited to have you here with us and get to talk with movies about you. I'm actually a really big fan of yours. Oh, good out. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I am a uh, a, a regular listener of Linoleum. I did it again. I I stumble over too, and it's been 12 years. (laughs) Um, Alonzo Duralde is the film reviews editor at The Wrap and hosts the podcast Linoleum Knife. Breakfast All Day, and Maximum Film. And for listeners who are paying attention to our classic Hollywood series, there is a great Venn diagram here of the golden age of Hollywood. Alonzo recently penned a listicle for the rap that was entitled 50 Great Romantic Comedies Made Before 1980 and wrote the book component of Turner Classic Movies' recent two-in-one puzzle featuring the silver screen's leading ladies and leading men. I'm exhausted. I know. Buddy, (laughs) do you you need a break? There was a pandemic. I needed something to do. (laughs) And in addition to writing puzzles, this listicle I bring up specifically because I think a lot of us on film Twitter were kind of disappointed by a recent, uh, you know, here are all of Hollywood's great rom-coms. And it was like the earliest one was, I don't know, uh, Pretty in Pink or something. (laughs) (laughs) So it was it. Great to look back and and have a more comprehensive list. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I saw that list. Actually, I didn't read the whole list, but I just saw the people talking about that list. And I was like, no, 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 no. And, <laughs> and so I, as much as I hate listicles in general, like they're the bane of my existence, this one felt like it needed to exist in the world. So thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Okay. So 50s. The 1950s. What an interesting time mm. in uh, American life. So like- What's going on? Like, what's going on in the 50s right now in cinema? What does that what does that look like? Well, I mean, there's, you know, obviously the war is over and we're, <laughs> we've never been more prosperous. And look at all the suburbs. And isn't it great to be a, you know, white, straight man? Uh, things have never been better. Um, but for the film industry, it's things are starting to get tricky because you've got the television happening. And that is, you know, before TV really gets into American homes, people go to the movies like three, four times a week. It is, you know, this sort of staple of, of, of American life. And, um, you know, you get these long programs and there's the kid matinees and all that kind of stuff. And that is starting to go away and theaters are shutting down. The courts rule that the studios can't own theater chains anymore. And Mm -hmm. so the business itself is just kind of being rocked at its core. And so over the course of the decade, we see that the way the studios do business and the way that movies are made in this country undergoes this radical shift. 
We're going to get a little deeper into the actual, the, the two films that we watched in preparation for this convo. But uh, one thing that struck me in All About Eve is that it's set in the world of theater and Broadway. And there are all these references to Hollywood. There's this thing where Broadway actors go away to the other side of the country and become famous or don't. Uh, and the writers and producers and all of that. And it struck me as like, you know, even still, I think obviously the Tonys don't have the type of viewership that the Oscars or the Emmys might because not everyone can get to Broadway and see the shows. Um, so as I'm always curious about the audience, when we were going through the 40s, I was thinking about like, what what type of woman is making a decision to go to see the movies and see a, a femme fatale film or a film noir? In the 50s, I mean, I have a probably inspired by television uh, archetype in mind of the family going out and seeing the newsreels and seeing a couple of cartoons and then, you know, seeing, a, I don't know, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, one of my <laughs> faves. Um, but what do you think it is like for people? I mean, do I don't know how ubiquitous television ownership was. Uh, my dad would tell stories about everyone going to his uncle's house because he was the one guy with the TV. Right. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't have the stats in front of me, and I, I probably should have before <laughs> this conversation. But, um, you know, I think obviously by 1959, you're looking at a lot more TVs and a lot more homes than in 1951, let's say. But, you know, at that point, I'd say early on, you you are still making movies for all the audiences. And you want to have kids come in. You want to have parents come in. You want to have the teenagers Um you know, you, you're starting to see the 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 teen exploitation boom is beginning to happen in the 50s, you know, where you've got your your like cheapo monster movies mm. and like drive-in. Drive-ins are becoming a thing really in a bigger way that they had. Not that they didn't exist before World War II, but, you know, because people are leaving the cities and heading out to the suburbs, you have these areas where it's cheap to grab up all this land and throw up a, a drive-in and more people have cars now and all that kind of stuff. Um you know, and, and I think what you do start seeing is the way that Hollywood reacts to this stuff is, it's funny that you mentioned Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, because this is a perfect example. Technicolor, mm. Cinemascope, 3D, like all the stuff that television cannot give you. Movies are getting wider and bigger and louder. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a whole number in, a, there's an MGM musical called Silk Stockings. That's a remake of Ninochka, and there's a song called Stereophonic Sound, and it's they they they're talking about like it's got to have glorious Technicolor, <laughs> breathtaking cinemascope, and stereophonic sound. Um, and and Seven Brides fits in that category absolutely. It was a big, anamorphic, you know, colorful, splashy MGM musical, and in fact, I remember going to. The Museum of the Modern, the Moving Image in um, in in London, and they had this little kind of diorama set up where in the background you see this huge screen showing uh, like the barn raising scene from Seven Brides or Seven Brothers, and in the foreground you see a guy sitting in an easy chair in <laughs> front of this like ten inch black right. and white television and and that was but that that 10 incher had an amazing power that the studios were dying to combat with as much juice as they could throw on the screen well it's incredible that that is happening like again and today and still and will there's always going to be some version of that but you know the first time that people realized you could be watching a film on your iphone 10 15 right. years ago <laughs> and then the last couple of years in the conversation of like in fact, I haven't looked at the numbers, but like, did people actually go out to see Downton Abbey A New Era? I don't know, but that was the big one where they thought, all right, finally, people who have stayed home might go back to the theaters. Um, and I think it did okay. Yeah. Uh, like, 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 maybe like not great pre COVID numbers, but where we are now, they were like, eh, that's all right. It's, it was, people are, there's some people are, are finally doing it. So, you yeah, know. we'll take it. Um, one of the things you said at the top about, you know, we're, back from war, everything's great for white dudes, reminded me of um, on Karina Longworth's podcast, you must remember this, one of her, I can't remember which uh, season it was, but she talked about how in the films from the 1950s have this undercurrent of like kind of challenging masculinity or like the crisis of masculinity. Mm. Um, and and you you we see a little bit of that in Sweet Smell of Success as well. Mm, and so sure. like, I think that that's... Uh, I didn't put those two things together, but like that probably is related to, okay, we're back from war. We're back home. Everything should be perfect. And it's kind of not right. 
And I think you see that in All About Eve as well, where, you know, I think one of the big differences about Broadway and Hollywood is that, you know, women on Broadway had a, a level of power that maybe their counterparts on the West Coast mm. didn't. And, and Betty Davis knew that better than anybody. You know, she was constantly fighting with the Jack Warners of the world, you know, for these roles. Whereas like these, these Broadway divas might not ever become movie stars. They might not ever get as famous nationally as their film counterparts, but they did wield a clout as leading ladies that, 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 that other media did not enjoy. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I also um, was thinking about how I, I can't, I'm just obsessed with the Hays Code. I brought up, brought up in like every episode. <laughs> yes. I'm just, I like, I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated by how long this thing lasted for um, and I was just looking up, Psycho came out in 1960, yeah. and that was one of the first, I think, like, credited as, like, really starting to create the cracks in the code, right, of, like, yeah, pushing that, it through, so, yeah. Well, I'll say, yeah, that, that'd be on the heels of, I think, in the 50s, you have Otto Preminger, who is going out of his way to defy the code, so, like, he makes The Moon is Blue, where they talk about, you know, they use the word pregnant and mm. virgin and stuff, you know, or The Man with the Golden Arm, where, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra's playing a heroin addict, uh, and he he fi fights for the right to have these movies released without the codes okay, so those are the, that's kind of where, where the armor starts to, to collapse, and then, yeah, Hitchcock and Psycho absolutely manages is another way to kind of push back against what was allowed and and that of course brings up this whole thing of you know when people get nostalgic that the whole the whole maga thing about like oh america the way it used to be they're usually remembering the way the movies were uh -huh. as though that was reality and the movies had this all this very strict set of codes about can't show this can't talk about that have to pretend this never happened and that's what they're remembering not the actual nation you know yeah and so like so, yeah, and we've talked about that. I think on the last episode, we talked a bunch about this in terms of um, this fantasy, this very conservative fantasy that the media or that the films were sort of being forced to put out there, which wasn't actually a reflection of our times, really. Right. It, it wasn't a reflection of the time, even though we now think of it that way because the media is so influential in our understanding of culture. Um, but so, you know, the, the movie system, like the studios are, it sounds like they're in a little bit of crisis right now, right? Like that, like, so what, what does that mean for what they're producing and what they're like scrounging for? You know, I think it sort of manifests in different ways. Costs are being cut. Um, you know, MGM starts really cutting back on their, their budgets as the decade proceeds. You see them attempting to kind of branch out into television. Like early on, there were, there was like a thin man TV show. You know, <laughs> they were trying to sort of recycle their properties in a way that you still see studios doing with their IP. Um, but definitely, I think they, you know, like a lot of the longer term contracts maybe started drying up for, you know, for the celebs, unless you were really an earner and they wanted to hang on to you, um, you know, they, they, that, they weren't as profligate with that kind of stuff as they had been. Um, Betty Comden talks about how when, uh, you know, they, they, you know, she wrote, uh, she and, and Adolph Green wrote um, three musicals in a row that, that are, you know, considered among the greatest ever made that Gene Kelly and Stanley Donnan directed, you know, On the Town, Singing in the Rain, and It's Always Fair Weather. And she said, yeah, On the Town and It's Always, and, and, and Singing in the Rain both premiered at Radio City Music Hall, and It's Always Fair Weather premiered at a drive-in in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Singing in the Rain makes me think of a, a question that only has occurred to me, I've seen this movie however many dozens of times, right? Only occurred to me when really diving into working on this series with the podcast is that if that movie were made today, it would be a period piece set in the 90s, right? Like right. This, this, is a, <laughs> this is when Hollywood has finally been around long enough to kind of take a look back at its own growth. And mm -hmm. we saw that in... In the 1930s, right, Stella Dallas, which we, is an, a, a movie we talked about in that episode, had already existed as a silent film sure. um, based on a novel. So it's not like uh, new ideas are being born every day. But I wondered about that as like, you know, the same thing happens today where a screenwriter is tasked with giving someone an ordinary job and they end up as like a, a sports agent or something. Um, <laughs> but how an audience member in Peoria, let's say, is watching the movie and able to really connect with like the business of show. 
that's right. such a common theme and it, com- it comes up in, I think, in both of the movies that we will talk about today. I mean, absolutely. being a press agent, I, it even took me a minute to kind of get into the world of the smell of success. And, and maybe we should um, hold on that until we <laughs> give people a, a little background. But uh, well, re- real quick, though, I just, you know, when you talk about the, the the distance between the talkies and the silent films and how sort of relatively recent that stuff was was happening, you have to remember, even before Singing in the Rain, in 1950, the same year as All About Eve, you've got Sunset Boulevard, <laughs> you know, which is, and, and so the, the idea that basically Norma Desmond hasn't made a movie in 23 years, wow. like that's, that's the giant gap, and yeah. now she's this crazy old lady, you know, rattling around this LA mansion, but it was that recent, it was that fresh, but the, the, the change to sound was so cataclysmic for certain people's careers that it still, that it felt like this massive historical shift, even though it was within the lifetime of most of the people sitting down to watch that movie. It's also fascinating, I think, to look at older films that are reflecting on the previous decades, mm. right? Like, it, cause that, like, if I watch a movie from the 19, from 1955, that's about 1925. It's the perspective of 1955 on 1925, but like, what the fuck difference do I know? I don't know what the twenties <laughs> are versus the fifties anyways. Right. And like, it, it's a part of that. Um, and I don't mean this as a pejorative, but like the manipulation of media, right. Of sure. like how we understand time periods really like, I, on one of the episodes, I talked about how I really wished that it was in color because I wanted to see the colors of the costumes, mm. <laughs> right? Like, there's just, like, there's just these these kinds of things of, like, what did people look like in black and white? I think as a kid, you're like, oh, well, the, the past was black <laughs> it was and white. was all black and white, of course. Yeah. <laughs> like, there wasn't real world here, right? I think that there's something so fascinating about uh, about that. And um, I, think, I think that's, oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Well, guy, I'm, I'm going to. Jump in because I want your I want you to tell me if I'm completely off base. But my understanding, even in the early days of of color film, is that color was used as a uh, to imply fantasy, and that more realistic film would be a black and white. And so, in The Wizard of Oz, when everything becomes color, <laughs> it's like and how that's so that seems bizarre, right? Like Pleasantville kind of spoke to that. <laughs> but then you know we would have you'd have your very serious courthouse dramas in black and white and then you'd have your goofy (laughs) seven brides for seven brothers which anita i'm going to make you watch this movie uh (laughs) this has come up so many times i've never even heard of it before i feel like i'm gonna have to check this oh i think from a feminist perspective there's a lot to unpack in that movie so (laughs) enjoy special bonus episode maybe (laughs) um yeah I, i think you're right i think that that because of the way that people were sort of trained to watch movies that until the fifties, when Technicolor kind of starts becoming more of a staple, just as again, a way to get people away from their sets. Um, yeah, it was saved for fantasy, for musicals, for, you know, uh, you know, period pieces in a, of a way like, uh, like I was, I was thinking there, there's an MGM three musketeers where every musketeer like has his own color story that he sticks <laughs> to for the entire movie. So like, there's always like the, the green one, the, 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 you yeah, know, like the, the, the power pink one and the, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that, yeah. So you always know exactly who's who and whenever there's like, and then suddenly when they're like at a ball or something and there's, you know, 20 women show up, it's like they were bridesmaids cause they've each got a different <laughs> shade on of the similar, you know, cut dress. Um, well, is that what we but, have now with 3D, right? Like our world is 3D, but we only go to see like superhero and avatar in 3D. Um, this is true. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's a, that's actually a really good comparison. And and even like in the 50s when 3D, when they were trying to break it. And and that was like, you go back and look and you realize all you think of, oh, the whole decade of being 3D. It was about a year and a half mm. where all of those movies come out. And then everybody's like, nah, nah, never mind. You know, well, also that also happened to us, right? Remember where it was yeah. like every movie was like retrofitted to be 3D for like a period of time. Oh, and the yes. TVs post, were 3D. And then that yeah. blew over. Right. And then. Um, um, I would also say, I don't, have you ever been to the, uh, what are they called? Like 4DX or whatever, the movie theater seats where they move like a, yeah. a yeah, the D-box roller coaster thing. ride. Yeah. It is the worst <laughs> experience. I I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. Like it's going to be goofy. It's like a, like a roller coaster. It was the most awful thing. And so I feel like there is so, other than like the production quality, right? Like the technology of, of, of VFX and and everything in CGI has changed. Um, those kinds of thing, those kinds of pieces aren't like the move from black and white to color or talking to like silent movie. Like, I don't know if we would ever really have a shift that dramatic again. 
But I guess that's not fair to say because who fucking knows what the future holds. Uh, yeah, this is true. Never say never. I mean, I, I think, you know, and I mean, not to in any way sort of equate these things, obviously, but like, I think in the same way that you look at 9-11 as being a point in the culture, in addition to its, you know, sort of political and, and real world ramifications, just in terms of what, how that affected the way that film and TV operated for, for quite a while. And, and to some extent, like still does. I mean, you could make a case the entire Marvel cinematic universe is an ongoing response to nine 11 mm. and this, the yeah, feeling of definitely. helplessness, you know? And so, but yeah, the, you would have to go to something that, you know, real world huge to compare to what, to what happened when movies started talking and, you had, you know, this total shift in people who were very successful performers now suddenly being like, oh, but I can't actually, my voice is, does not match my, you know, beautiful profile or whatever. And they're just gone, you know, right. and, and and they're trucking in all these like, you know, New York theater people uh, all of a sudden, you know, to California to, to like, to, to Giving say them words. fake accents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. To, to teaching not them how to do the yeah. mid-Atlantic. Yeah. Um, why don't I introduce the films? Um, we, we can still talk big picture, but it, it might help us root a little bit into the specifics of some of the things, especially because these films are from the beginning and the end of the, the decade. So we watched, um, on Alonzo's recommendation, Joseph L. Mankiewicz's 1950 drama All About Eve, starring Betty Davis as an aging, that is to say, 40. <laughs> She's fucking 40. Uh, Broadway star, and which... I am almost, so you go fuck yourself, movie. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, and Ann Baxter as her manipulative, devoted young fan. We also watched the 1957 film, Noir, Sweet Smell of Success. I love it. Sound, that's such a good title, Sweet. right? The alliteration. Uh, directed by Alexander McKendrick, uh, starring Burt Lancaster and Tony Curtis, and produced by Lancaster's own nascent production company. Fun little fact. I was just watching the fourth um, season of Marvelous Miss Maisel, mm. and she does a little shout out to Sweet Smell of Success. And I was like, I've seen that fucking movie. <laughs> I get this goddamn joke. <laughs> there, there's a character in Diner who actually, he kind of walks in and out of scenes, and he spends the entire film reciting that movie, oh. Sweet Smell of Success, like just obsessively. That's all he does in the film. Well, there is a... a a monologue from All About Eve that I'm determined to uh, memorize. <laughs> and when we get oh, wow. to it, I'll probably ask Rob to drop in the audio, but a little <laughs> Perfect. Pro plot overview for any of our listeners who haven't seen these movies. In All About Eve, the ambitious titular character ingratiates herself into the world of her favorite actress, Margot Channing, advancing her own path to stardom while interfering in the lives of everyone close to Margot, including her dear friend Karen and the playwrights that both women are involved with. In The Sweet Smell of Success, a shady press agent gets embroiled in an even shadier newspaper columnist's plot to split up the relationship between his younger sister and jazz guitarist. Threats of cannabis use and communist alliance, crooked cops, and the currency of cigarette girls. Nothing is off the table to achieve their sleazy goal. There were such good turns of phrase in this movie. Oh. <laughs> the cat's in okay. the bag and the bag's in the river. Oh, <laughs> oh. that was good. Well, so why did you pick these two movies? Why were these the movies of the 19th that like help us define or understand the 1950s? Well, I was thinking about, you know, I sort of wanted to compare a, a very much, you know, fully minted studio effort, you know, as, as the early film, as we're going into the 50s where the studios still have a great deal of power and control over the production and distribution of movies. And then I wanted the later one to be something of a relatively uh, independent effort. And so with Sweet Smell of Success, as you mentioned, Burt Lancaster with uh, his partners Hecht and Hill had started this production company. So you have movie stars, like bankable movie stars, going from being employees of the studio, under contract to the studio, and kind of subject to the whims of the studio, and now being like, no, 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 I'm going to create this, and I'm going to sell it to you if you want it, mm. studio, and you're going to distribute it. And so that's a real that's a real power shift that would have been unimaginable a decade or so before. Um, and then I thought the two films just kind of 
paired. I, I've never thought about them as a double feature before, but it has this whole like, you know, twisted, you know, mentor prodigy relationship. They're both very New York movies, but whereas All About Eve is a very glamorous, you know, kind of stork club, uh, a fancy New York with the occasional, you know, backstage thrown in. Like it's a much seedier, grittier New York, you know, shot by James Wong Howe in the second film, but also very much enmeshed in the world of show business. And there is a world where you imagine these these characters from the two different films bumping into each other somewhere or other, you know? Can we talk about James Wong Howe for a minute? I looked him <laughs> up after watching this movie because it was beautiful to look at. Yeah. And I I was stunned by so much of the use of shadow and uh, learned that he was not only an innovator in so many ways in the 30s and 40s, but that also... He immigrated to America when he was five years old and then couldn't become a citizen because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. His marriage was not recognized because of anti-miscegenation laws. Like this man was absolutely like a name I should have learned when I was in film school and didn't. And I, I hope everyone, if you haven't seen this movie, take the time to watch it. It's gorgeous to look at. Yeah, I, I love the way he makes New York look. I mean, just those, it's like they're like Ouija photographs or something. <laughs> just the way those little all-night dinettes and stuff are, are lit. And, you know, yeah, I mean, how was amazing. Like, he, I think I want to say that he's like the first guy to put a camera in a helicopter <sighs> at the end of at the end of Picnic. And you look at the fisheye lens stuff that he does for John Frankenheimer's seconds. Like, he was one of the masters. And, yeah, you're right. I mean, like... What you know had a, had that kind of twentieth century for you know being a, a, as a non-white dude. You know? Yeah, I feel like I had like pretty different reactions to both of these movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like they 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 sit differently. Oh yeah. Um, with sweet smell of success, I I didn't enjoy it um, necessarily, and it took me a minute because to like I understood overall what was happening, but there was so many like specifics that I was like. Huh? What? <laughs> like, why is there a phone in a restaurant? What's a late newspaper? Like, and like some of the, and because of the talk, the talking is very quick, right? Yes. It's very like, like, and it's, it's rhythmic, right? It, it's, it's got a pizzazz to it that I was like, oh, there might, th- a lot of these references are probably of the time and I don't know the time, like, but not enough that you can't get what's going on, but it, it took me. I had to settle into it and sort of accept that my brain is just going to fill in the gaps that it doesn't understand. Um, And yeah, I I think it was like with both, with both of the movies, this is, I don't, I haven't quite figured this out yet. I watched them a little too late, Um, but there's something about the, like, they're both really simple. Mm. Right. And I kept being like, I would never really describe a movie today as simple. Why do I think that movies today are like more complex? But these are both. I was just like, yeah, this chick wants to get into Hollywood or into the theater. And like she's manipulative and shitty about it. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just like they felt it, they felt small. Does it might does this? Well, I, I mean, I think they're yeah. very they're very insular worlds. I mean, like yeah. you know, uh, uh, they 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 talk about like the, the, this notion of Broadway being this like stretch of you know theaters along a uh, half a mile of New York City, you mm-hmm. know, and obviously the world of 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 J J Hunsecker and Sidney Falco revolves around this very tight knit sort of cluster of like nightclubs and you know theaters. So yeah, they they are small, but it, they're about being very big fish in those yeah. ponds, you know. And it's weird like my reaction to the fact like I I'm feeling uh tension in myself being like my reaction is a little bit like, so what? Like, why would you make a movie about that? But I don't know. But like, I could tell you movies today that I love that are like about a couple breaking up. Sure. And I think that they're brilliant, right? And that's an insular small thing. So there's something, I don't know quite yet what's not, it, I, why I'm like, meh. It might help well. to think about like Hunsecker is basically Walter Winchell. And Walter Winchell, mm, between his, mm. he had a nationally syndicated newspaper columnist, column, he had a radio show, I think he had an early TV show the way that Hunsecker does. So these people have a huge cultural footprint. And that's part of, you see that happening in Sweet Small Success, where, where the jazz guy is sort of putting down everything that's sort of trumped up and artificial about J.J. Hunsecker, and he gets mortally offended on behalf of his thousands of, of viewers and listeners. You're insulting them, not me, which is such a Tucker Carlson reaction, uh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I also wonder if it, it 
and I don't know again what like the mainstream world uh, know. Like I know that like gossip columnists are huge. Like they're very invasive. They really make. Uh, real problems for actors as they do today. Right. That's not a new industry. But I wonder if the like the manipulation and the behind the scenes machination was maybe like a surprising concept for audiences or like that this movie felt a little bit like seeing behind the scenes yeah, in a way pr- that- pro- Probably, yeah. I, th- I think, uh, again, th- you know, these are movies about sort of like facades and then what's really happening. I'm sure people think, oh, Margot Chan and Great Lady of the Theater, you know, and she even kind of puts on that voice when they bring Eve backstage to meet her for the first time. Yeah. And then you you get to know the real her and it's like she's funny and she's you know uh you know she she's you know she she's like she, she's the kind of dame will tell you a dirty joke you know uh but like but you know but she can put on that sort of like oh yes i'm you know mary martin or whatever sort of broadway diva kind of thing and and same thing hunsecker his whole you know trafficking is like i'm i'm here to tell you the truth and i'm here to you know give you the unvarnished stuff and i mean yeah they were gossip columns but they were also like very pluggy and like I think Liz Smith and uh, Larry King are maybe the last practitioners of Mm. that style of newspaper column. Where people would be like, you know, they, they and they even reference in uh, George Jean Nathan in in All About Eve, and it's like it was a way for people to like feel they were in the know and they were tied in, and like this guy had all the dish and he was going to tell you, and some of it was scandalous and some of it was you know quote unquote funny, but it was you know that you you knew what the movers and shakers were up to. It wasn't necessarily just like so and so is sleeping with so and so, and those you know and and that kind of stuff still exists. I mean, I think. You know, like E, you know, that was that was sort of their whole point of existence was to be like, well, you know, this person is leaving that TV show to make this movie or blah, blah, blah. You know, Entertainment Weekly during its heyday, I think people like to feel like they're connected to this stuff and that they're knowledgeable and they get these are the kind of reporters that, that, that make that stuff happen. And so, yeah, I think the idea of this guy is you know, has an agenda that he's going to do is capable of all sorts of like just super crappy backstabby stuff. Yeah. That, that probably was, you know, for at least some of the audience uh, surprise. I I had a, a, a little bit of a different reaction to the movies, Anita, but I also felt like they sat differently with me. And I, I wondered like watching these movies made me think about myself as an audience member more than I wish. Um, And with All About Eve, my gut reaction was that this movie wasn't kind to women. And then as I thought about it for a couple of days, I thought that this movie was like, showed these very powerful women and these very complicated women. And, you know, initially what I saw was a lot of sort of gaslighting of like, ah, it's so stupid of you to think that I might like a younger, prettier woman. That's crazy. (laughs) And then men slapping women and telling them this is how it's going to be and there's nothing you can do about it. But then afterwards, I thought like, I think probably uh, Mankiewicz wrote the movie and I think did a great job with these characters. I read that uh, the screenwriter of The Favorite was heavily inspired by this movie when she wrote Mm -hmm. that script. But both of the movies, I did feel like, had complicated plots that wouldn't necessarily exist today. So Sweet Smell of Success, I I would be a little bit dazzled by the dialogue or the visuals. And then I would find that I'd lost my way a little bit and being able to rewind and (laughs) rewatch a scene before continuing. I'd say to myself, like, wait, so are they... Are they going to try to kill the guy or, oh, they're planting marijuana on him? Like, so I kind of had to go back. Which which fat, ugly cop is he talking about? You know, <laughs> did I see this guy in a bar before? Um, are we supposed to like the guy that's setting up the cigarette girl for sexual trafficking or whatever's happening in that scene? But then to think about yeah, how or, today. Or also, are you supposed to be impressed with his machinations, right. right? When you see the like the levels of chess that he's playing to get these stories planted, right? Like right. you're you're impressed and also horrified at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, he is a cookie full of arsenic, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think ultimately, yeah, yeah. We're, he's he's very much an anti-hero, and 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 I think again, that's probably one of the reasons why the, the the film did not do well originally. Like it has it has attained a reputation over the decades, but audiences in the fifties did not were not down for it. But it's it's a noir film. It is it is a film about people doing terrible, terrible 
control things. And, you know, thanks to the Hayes Code, they're not going to get away with them. But the movie is basically not going to stand back and have some character be like, you know, you really shouldn't do that. Like, it, yeah. we're just meant to look at it and go, oh, no, that's awful. That is awful. So the only Burt Lancaster movie I've seen before is From Here to Eternity. Mm. Ultimate kind of picture of like sexuality, I think, in the mid 50s, probably in a big Hollywood movie. But I was kind of surprised then to see, you know, especially knowing that he is the one who brought this movie to life, that he has put himself in this like pretty um, uh, Citizen Kane-esque kind of (laughs) role. Um, So, you know, is that part of the reason maybe people wanted to see him as a a leading man and not as this Uh, kind of character? Yeah, I mean, I think he wanted to take this role on because it was very different from anything else he had really done up until that point. I mean, this is a guy who comes into the movies via the circus. Like, he was a trained acrobat. So you see him in movies like Trapeze or, you know, like uh, The Crimson Pirate, where he's, like, swinging on ropes and walking a tightrope. And, like, he's he was always, like, one of the most sort of physical. He played, you know... Uh, a Jim Thorpe and Newt Rockney, I th- not maybe not Newt Rockney, but Jim Thorpe for sure. And um, and so yeah, so to have him be in a movie where he wore glasses and sat down the whole time <laughs> was like a big departure for him. But you know, and in fact, I think you know he was smart enough as a producer to kind of understand the the one for me, one for them, because mm. he and Tony Curtis also made a movie that he produced called Trapeze, where they are like trapeze artists in a circle in a circus, and they're both in love with Gina Lola Brigida, and so that movie gives you all the like sort of sex and glamour and athleticism that you would expect. And this is the sort of, you know, let's get Clifford Odets to write a movie about horrible New York, you know, showbiz it hangers on, you know, mm. um, there's not, uh, the roles of women in sweet smell of success and all about Eve, I think are very polar opposites. Oh, yeah. Like if you looking at all about Eve, there's just so many women <laughs> in this movie. Right. And it's about women and it's, it's about Eve, but, but it's not all about Eve, but it is, you know, um, and I think I'd love to like kind of poke a little bit at what you're saying, Kat, it like unpack uh, more about like, it feels like it's kind of shitty to women, but it also feels complicated and not shitty to women. And that like tension that we sit with, with, with this film, like, I, I, I really agree with that. As an aside, I fucking love Birdie and there yes. wasn't enough Birdie in this movie. <laughs> She's like the, I don't know, the assistant, the dresser, um, the dresser to, to Margot, And she's just the most delightful at one point she says kill the people and i'm like is that like break a leg I'm, yeah. like, what, I'm like what does that mean but it's great i kind of want to start i use it all the that. time but whenever i somebody i know is about to go on central i'm like kill the people yeah <laughs> kill the people <laughs> um but she was just i uh, i wanted more of her and she like you don't see her as much towards the latter half of the film um but okay so you know i think there is a a note on this film where you could be like well women are manipulative and they're superficial and they're self involved and women are you know women be women kind of <laughs> whatever energy but there is something really interesting about like yeah the reality that women of a certain age get cast out and aren't as important and like trying to hold on to your fame when there's younger women who are more attractive and what does that mean for your personal and professional life like i think that's kind of an interesting thing to unpack and especially in this time and in this place and with someone like betty davis uh playing that role um and she specifically calls out the industry (laughs) and says can you says to her playwright boyfriend or I can't remember if it was director. Karen's husband, <laughs> director, one of these creatives. Can you be a little more, have a little more courage and just write me a nice, simple lady who kills her husband? And I thought, like, that was such a great, again, she's 40. This Betty Davis is, says she's just turned 40, but she has been acting for 20 years. And she, her character is playing somebody that now could be played by somebody much younger and is just saying like, why am I not given better material? And I thought that was like, what a thing for this man to write in his script and have out there. Yeah. yeah. And then I, oh, sorry, please. Well, no, I mean, the, the, you are watching a movie about a woman who is 40 and, and yeah, and she is lamenting that there aren't enough roles for women who are 40. And, and <laughs> I mean, he's, he's kind of making that point and sort of also demonstrating and, and aren't you enjoying this? Isn't yeah. this entertaining? Don't you want to see more movies about women who are 40? Yeah. Yeah. That's bold. I also like the character Eve. 
is such an interesting character too, right? Like you kind of know pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, you know, pretty instantly that she's like pulling one over and she's, you know, this manipulative, whatever, uh, you know, trying to get her foot in the door by doing all these things and being perfect and all of that. And, um, and Margot is loving the attention, right? Like she, in a way that she probably hasn't in a long time because it's all become, you know, theater fans or whatever. Right. Um, and there's something in the same way that like um, film noir or um, femme fatales irk me um, that like manipulate Like I would like, I would like, I would like there to be female characters of all moral compass, <laughs> like all spectrums of the moral compass um, villainous and otherwise. But I feel like the, what we've been watching, at least in this series, is just a lot of women who are like kind of bad and kind of manipulative and probably because those were the more interesting roles mm. that were written for women. Right. Like there it, if you compare it to Sweet Smell of Success, you've got the cigarette girl who is basically being forced to be a sex worker or to like sleep her way up um, or, or to keep her job. And then you have the like the girl, the sister who has no agency and the minute she gets agency, the movie's fucking over. Right? Like, <laughs> right. So it's, it's just interesting that like you, the spectrum of where women can fall and the roles that are, that they get to play and what we get to see on film. Right. Like, yeah, it's cool that you have these two women starring in this thing, but it just bothers me that I'm like, I don't know. Am I yeah, making a point the, somewhere? The, the straight guys and all about Eve are so negligible though. You know, the director yeah. and the playwright, like they're there and they serve a function in the plot and stuff, but like no one remembers them. And they, you know, it's that thing, you know, where like you, when you cast Joan Crawford, then you cast like Zachary Scott next to her. Like there's never, like, you know, the, 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 the men are never bringing that much to the table. So like it's really, it's the women and the gay guy. Like they're the ones who are really <laughs> running this yeah. show and, and pushing everybody to their right, really, to whatever corner, you know. It's Betty Davis. Like she is just, it's hard to take your eyes off her. Yeah. Like it's hard to th realize that there's anything else happening on screen. That's not her. Right. Um, Marilyn Monroe shows up for <laughs> five minutes and you're like, Whoa, <laughs> like, it's just, it's a little, I didn't expect it. And it's, she's so young, right? Like yeah. the images that we know of her today, um, the, the main pop culture ones are of her a little bit older. And you're like, Holy shit. Like yeah. it was, it was a little startling. But also I felt like she was already, cementing kind of the roles that she the role she would come to have where she's sure. that that character could have had no lines and fit perfectly into the story but she had a couple of just nice little zingers about like not being able to get a word in edgewise with this guy that she's going to audition with or um, why do they all look like unhappy rabbits <laughs> yeah i mean just enough little sense of humor out of this you know kind of bimbo character that she's supposed to come in as i also want to take a moment to acknowledge the final scene of the movie when uh, Phoebe call shows up. Yeah. From, I call myself Phoebe. I call myself <laughs> Phoebe. And there's, uh, first I was baffled by all the high school girls have a Eve Harrington club. Again, I was like, what, are, are all the high school girls going on field trips to Broadway? I, I'm curious <laughs> about how that works. Maybe they just Maybe like Sydney Falco is her press agent and made that happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but then there's, you know, it was almost like so artistic that it took me out of the moment. But there's this shot of her hold, you know, trying on Eve's dressing cape. gown or cape with all of the mirrors around that I, you know, I was fascinated. How did they actually get that shot um, without CG? But it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like the expected, the expectation is like, well, we know from the first moment we meet Eve that there's going to be the like sub version of Eve that shows up again <laughs> at the end. Like this is the cycle that this story is going to take. And again, like I found that to be a little bit predictable, whereas everything that Betty Davis was doing was not. And that was where the magic was for me in that movie. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I think obviously, yeah. There, the, as you as you said, you can look at this movie and think, oh God, they're really they're really dumping on women, or or wow, they're really empowering women and kind of letting them tell their story. And you know, uh, there are I, I think like I, I find the relationship between Eve and Karen fascinating. Not even sorry, Margot and Karen yes. fascinating because 
you know, Karen is, you know, she's a Radcliffe girl and, you know, clearly comes from money and a cushier background, whereas Margot really had to work her way up. You know, she had to work in a shop as a kid. Uh, but in this wor- in this weird world of the theater, they are on equal footing and they can find each other and be friends and, and when maybe nowhere else in the world or in society would that have ever happened, you know? Um and then when Margot gives herself that that moment of vulnerability in the car and talks about turning 40 and about, you know, the job of being a woman, like, I think that's actually a pretty bold statement for 1950 to be like, you know, yeah, I have this career, it's fulfilling, it's great. But at the same time, I can't go to bed with my clippings that's, you know, with my reviews, you know. And unfortunately, she operates in an era in which she kind of has to pick one. Right. But at least she's picking. It's not like, well, we don't want you anymore. You're too old. Get out of here. Okay, then I guess I'll get married. Like, she is determining her course. And I find that part of it really interesting. And they even reference Macbeth in this. And I had a moment of like, oh, you're not supposed to say the name Macbeth in the theater. (laughs) But then... They also kind of reference in that car scene, Lady Macbeth, you know, says to the spirits, unsex me here. And Margot is saying, like, I have to choose to be a woman or to give up the things that make me a woman so that I can be successful. And I I mean, I would. Again, I want to watch this movie again and like go through the text. I want to read the script of it. Um, Yeah. Yeah, there it's it's interesting because um nobody nobody's happy. <laughs> and nobody <laughs> ends up very ha- like to some degree, right? Uh, well, I guess Margot does make well, anyways, you have Margot like who can't see what's in front of her, right? Like can't see that she has someone who loves her, that she's in love with. Their relationship is so cute at the beginning. Um and that she still has a career, right? Like she's still very much it popular. Um, and then you also have um, Eve, who, when she gets what she wants, she realizes the cost of getting right. it, right? Um, and, you know, there's something about, you know, the larger moral of this, of, like, what's really important in life, right? Is it the people that you love and the people that care about you and your community and all of that and not, like, your career or whatever, even though we're all, we're all, we, we're, they're all still going to strive for those things, right? They want the acclaim and the awards and all of that kind of stuff. And there's always going to be Phoebe's and Eve's and, right. and, but, and, and Mar- but Margo has that line about the things that you, that you shed on your way up the ladder so that you'll move faster. You mm-hmm. find you're going to need them later. And so, you know, when mm. we cut to Eve, we see, well, you don't have any of those things. And so good luck with that. You know? Yeah. But she gets them. No, no, no. But I mean, I'm saying Eve doesn't have the things like friends and relationships which is what what Margaret was talking about the things you shed on the, yeah, way but up the ladder. Yeah, but I would say but she she did have those things. She, yes, like and she sheds and she, them. <laughs> and she sheds them. Yeah. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 when okay, you yeah. see her at the end of the movie, she is She's alone. Yeah, she is open yeah. to the Phoebes of the world because there's nobody around her to sort of run interference or like be a sounding board or whatever and and that's <laughs> kind of that's what Eve's come up and says even if she's a big success now. The yeah. Phoebes of there the world. There is that moment <laughs> Such a good little yeah, epithet. <laughs> yeah. There's that moment where um, they are in the car and, and she's like revealing that she's like, I'm going to stop being a child and petulant and whatever. And Karen just slumps. And I was just like, it was so, it was such a good physical acting where she just like slumps down. Right. Um, and it's one of those moments in movies where you're like, well, if everyone had just fucking talked about their goddamn feelings, <laughs> none of this would have happened, and then we would have never had this fucking movie, right? Where you're just, like, yelling at the TV, being like, just talk about your feelings, damn it. It's the same thing. I, One five-minute conversation. With Sweet Smell of Success, where I was like, yeah, today, like, a, a well-timed Instagram post would have, you know, wiped out all of this plot. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. There was so much well, of passing of well, notes and, like, all Why did little- JJ hate... Why did JJ hate, like, was he, did he just never want his sister to leave and he, she, he would have hated anyone that she was with? Like, I didn't really understand that yeah, hatred. I think there's an unspoken sort of incestuous thing happening there where, where no one is good enough for her, but certainly not, you know, a jazz guitarist played by Martin Milner, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think the impression is that nobody would, would be good enough yeah. and that he always wants to sort of like have that girl. And it's not like he's married or has anybody else in his life. So she's sort of the one person. Yeah. Yeah. That he, you know, not only can like directly control, but maybe also is sort of trying to shield from what he knows is this barbarous world of show business and nightclubs and such and doesn't want her tainted by it. 
Yeah. Because he's part of what makes it so barbarous, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and there was, some, you know, they did also build that contrast of that he, everyone else is manipulative and lying and scheming. And this guy just wants to play jazz and marry the woman he loves. Like, yeah. and he's just like honorable, right? Like there's that whole thing about integrity mm. and just being like, I never thought that I would be using someone's integrity against them or some shit like that. I forget what the line was. You clearly both know all of these movies <laughs> and all the lines to all these movies. But no, I mean, that, um, yeah, clearly that, that is like one of the, one of the tools in the Sydney Falco kid is like, Oh, you have actual morals. I can use that. You know? Right. <laughs> And was, Which is so hard to watch, you know? You're just like, this. these poor people, <laughs> leave them alone. <laughs> and is Tony Curtis, is he like always the, the scoundrel, the scamp kind of? I mean, I've seen him in Gentlemen, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. No, uh, Some Like It Hot. Some Like It Hot. Um, he, he, he was rakish a lot, mm-hmm. certainly in, in a lot of comedies and, you know, romances and stuff. But this is a movie where... He's, you know, I mean, and, and, and what is it? JJ Sugger is like, you're a rascal, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it's like, but he's, he's kind of showing you the dark aspects of that. It's like, yeah, I'm not just, you know, oh, you know, a, a smooth talker. Like I'm a manipulative piece of crap, you know? Yeah. And, and I will use those powers to get what I want and try and, you know, raise up my station, no matter w- what corpses I leave under me. There was a, a, a guilelessness that I feel like all of these characters in this world had to have. And the fact, yeah, the fact that our leader of the the Cinco Quartet or whatever it was <laughs> didn't have it, Quintet. Um, and that was, I mean, kind of, yeah, it's similar to All About Eve. It's like you have to have someone like this in your corner if you want to get anywhere. Even if you're just some magician or juggler or whatever that one guy <laughs> was who was like. He was a comedian. <laughs> I got to get ahead. <laughs> so I, that means I'm going to have to get involved in some sort of blackmail. Um, all right. I have a, a absolute whopper of a Wikipedia, uh, tidbit that I challenge both of you to segue from after I (laughs) lay it up here, but I discovered that the actress who plays Susie Hunsecker, Susan Harrison, uh, her daughter is none other than Darva Conger, winner of who wants to marry a millionaire. (laughs) Wow. God, I love Wikipedia. I did not know that. Just with a Wikipedia photo of her being like given a award at a Playboy ceremony or something in very year 2000 garb. And I just thought, um, you know, anybody's related to anybody, but it was just such like a name I never thought I'd hear or think of ever again and for the rest of my life. So... There's there's a line in uh, there's a movie I love called From the Journals of Gene Seberg where where um, Mary Beth Hurt plays Gene Seberg sort of looking back at her life from the afterlife and showing mm. clips from her films and talking about stuff. It's a Mark Rappaport movie, and at one point she talks about how in Hollywood history everybody is a movie or a bed or a wedding ring from everyone else. Yes, and uh, in Carrie Fisher's uh, it's one of her. HBO Wishful drinking or yeah or can't remember but where she does she has like the oh, the chart the yes. chart of everyone that she is related to by affair or by <laughs> birth or by marriage and it is I'm pretty sure Tony Curtis is in there so <laughs> <laughs> right I wouldn't be surprised yeah uh, look when your stepmother is Elizabeth Taylor that totally blows up the, yeah. you know, the possibilities um. Before we wrap up, I guess I had one more question, like larger picture question. This is not a good transition. It doesn't matter. I, j- I just own my it bad works. transitions. It's fine. Yeah. Well, we're I'm now. curious. <laughs> we're here now. We're doing it. Um, I'm curious. You know, we did talk about how like All About Eve is very female focused and Sweet Smell of Success women are kind of background in the space or like more objectified. Um. And like in the fifties, what was it? What was film looking like? Like were women getting these kind of meaty roles that all about Eve is showing us like, were there more opportunities, more stories like this, or was this a little anomalous? I mean, they were out there. I think again, you still, you do still have studios kind of trying to appeal to wider audiences. So like, you know, Joan Crawford is still making movies, not to the extent that she was like at MGM or whatever. Uh, But I think overall, when you look at the post-war American landscape, there was this crushing, um, uh, reactionary uh, 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 bent, you know, going on where during the war, women suddenly were 
having jobs. You know, they were mm. working in the aircraft factories. They were driving the buses. They were doing all the stuff that men were doing. And then when the men started coming home and wanted those jobs back, there was such a societal and governmental push to like get women back at home, taking care of the kids, like, you know, d- d- retreating to the quote unquote traditional norms of, of gender. And so I think, I think show business reflects that. Like, I think that in the, if you looked at like fifties rom-coms and stuff, this is really where you start seeing the like, Oh, and we're getting married kind <laughs> of movies, you know? Um, so I mean, yeah, there we are get a good, brand new stove, exactly, dishwasher, and, and a fur coat. You know, there there <laughs> yeah. there are going to be outliers like All About Eve, but for the most part, I think you're seeing society in general being really uh, uh, conservative about what they think women should be and aspire to, and and that's reflected in the mass media. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And I wonder if you'll give us a little bit of a look ahead. I, I, one of my favorite movies of all time is at 19, 1959 on the beach. And this is oh, where we yeah. get into some, some nuclear panic, a, a apocalypse kind of style going on. Right. <laughs> I feel like it's also kind of a nice counter to From Here to Eternity. Um, but when... On a very different beach. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So then we have... Um, we have this, like, what's what's to come? You know, now would this movie, you said uh, Sweet Smell of Success wasn't super successful at first, but by the end yeah. of this decade, has it now kind of broken open where independent film can kind of be born? Uh, yeah, it's you're you're seeing it more and more. You know, when they they give an Academy Award to Marty, which mm-hmm. is again also very uh, much a non studio movie, and is in fact based on a drama that was first performed on television. Mm. Um, so that's starting to shake things up. So you, you're going to, you, you start getting into the sixties and that's where you start seeing like the studio is really kind of imploding and like a lot of people shooting in Europe and the rise of these really kind of big sort of independent financier types, your, your Joseph E. Levine's, you know, your Dino De Laurentiis's and, um, the mogul power is going away from the front office at the studio and going into the hands of these independent producers who are making their own deals and signing their own starlets and doing all that stuff on their own. Is there a presence for like international cinema, Kurosawa and, you know, Italian and and Swedish film? Is that like happening in the U S or is that just like me 50 years later and looking back (laughs) at it? I mean, you know, like certainly I think if you live in New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco or Chicago, yes. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, I mean, yeah, I'm sure like the seventh seal starts making its way around and probably plays a lot of universities and stuff, but there is something of a, of an, that, that decades version of Indian art house. But that, again, that's going to really explode in the sixties as well. Cause you've got the French new wave happening. And so that's what like, you know, the young people are talking about. And obviously as the boomers are starting to come of age and becoming this mammoth force in society, just as ticket buyers and as sort of cultural, you know, uh, uh, uh barometers, you know, so much of of what's gonna gonna wind up being made is gonna be aimed at that audience because that's they are they're like fifty one percent of the population mm. uh, and and yeah so they're the ones who are gonna make household names out of you know Antonioni and Fellini and 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 Godard and Truffaut and 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 those folks and so that's that's gonna be you know we're still a few years away from that at the end of the fifties but it's about to happen like Breathless I think gets made fifty nine sixty um yeah. so you know it's 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 just around the corner. Inspiring yeah. my haircut for the last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> New York haircut. Uh, I do, <laughs> do want to, I mean, we're not in the 60s yet, but I do want to call out Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which also stars Be- uh, Betty Davis, yeah. um, which we did a podcast episode about years ago. Um, first film I ever saw with Betty Davis in it. Wow. Fucking fantastic, <laughs> fantastic movie. Um, but it was one of Ebony's, one of Ebony's favorites. And so years ago, I will, we'll link to it if you want to hear some some chatter about that, which is not that many, you know, it, like it's interesting because in what 50, 51, when all about Eve comes out a decade later, Betty Davis is like doing a hag film, right? right. Like doing this, like well, old, inventing the hag film. Really? Yeah. Right? Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. Which is like, what a testament to her, like her presence and existence in, in Hollywood, right. Absolutely, to be able yeah. to, to play that wide swath of uh, characters and not just be thrown out. And um, then as as 
would be if you were 40. And then to be immortalized in a pop song <laughs> Dex- <laughs> two decades later, <laughs> Betty Davis that eyes. Too. Like that's the first thing I <laughs> oh, think Oh, that's of. right. Yeah. There we go. All right. And, and I think well, it, it says something about the sort of changing look and, and existence of, of women in the world and in Hollywood that when we get around to making feud, you know, about the <laughs> behind the scenes machinations, both Betty Davis and Joan Crawford are cast with actresses who were decades older than they were at the time. Right. Uh, but, you know, because a, a 40 year old in 1962 does not look like a 40 year old in, in, in 2020, obviously. So, you know, just all of this stuff is, is, is the, the, the wheels of history are crushing the us all. The snake eating its tail. When when they made All About Eve into a stage play, it was uh, Gillian Anderson and Lily James a couple of right. years ago. And there's, well, al- there, there's also a musical uh, called Applause that Lauren McCall <laughs> did in the 70s. Oh, wow. With an exclamation wow. point? No. Oh, damn. <laughs> Shocking. <thing. laughs> Surprising. I mean, I don't think so. I'll have to look now. But and, and it was it was actually they it was filmed for CBS. Oh. Uh like on videotape. They they did it as a point. Like you can you can see numbers from it on YouTube. Amazing. Fascinating. All right. Well, y'all, stay tuned for next week when we talk about the 60s. Um, we're gonna talk about how Um, A lot of the black female actors that were prominent in the 50s uh, went on to be activists in the 60s and like how that role shifted. So that's going to be a really interesting conversation. Alonzo, you are wonderful. (laughs) Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for giving us the little modicum of time that you have available. (laughs) Where can people find out more about you? Is there anything specific you'd like to plug here? Uh, sure. I mean, the easiest place is always just go to follow me on Twitter at a Duralde, A-D-U-R-A-L-D-E, where I shamelessly link to everything. But yeah, you can read my reviews of The Wrap, um, the aforementioned podcast. I also pop in once a week on uh, the Deck the Hallmark podcast. We've been doing a thing called 25 Weeks of Christmas, where uh, my co-host, Bran, who was born in 1992, uh, I've been sh- making him watch Christmas films from before he was born, and he's been making me rewatch ones that he loves that I just don't get. Uh, so that's what I love. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. If you want to help support the show, please go to patreon.com slash femfreak. Our show is engineered by Rob Para. Carrie Stimson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.